The New Tech Times, a video magazine for the electronic age. In this edition, laser surgery may offer heart patients a new lease on life. Also, the puck stops here as computers coach goalies. Later, a look at Solar Atlanta and Orlando Xanadu, a high-tech house of the future. All this and more in this edition of the New Tech Times. The New Tech Times is brought to you through a grant from Wausau Insurance Companies. Times change. Wausau works. And by the collective voice of the consumer electronics industry. CEG, the Consumer Electronics Group. Electronic Industries Association. I'm Nicholas Johnson. This week we bring you an interesting look at the mixed uses for electronics in these new tech times. We begin with a very human report on the future use of lasers in heart surgery. There's medical electronics everywhere, from measurement of temperature and blood pressure to CAT scanners and computers. But laser surgery is one of the most exciting. It's not cheap. A scalpel costs $2, a laser $100,000. It may increase risks and cause doctors to retrain like assembly line workers displaced by robots. But the human benefits can be enormous. Here's Gary Probst's report. There are few things more dramatic than open heart surgery. A person's chest is opened, the heart fully exposed, and the body is put on life support. Many times it's a bypass operation. The patient's coronary arteries are blocked by fatty tissue. Graphs of the person's leg arteries are spliced over clogged vessels, acting as conduit, taking blood to and from the heart. The surgery is a traumatic physical and emotional experience for people like television producer Nigel McKean. They found out that there was uh, a large amount of blockage in there. I think it was 85 percent in four arteries. And so I was taken immediately into uh, surgery and uh, was operated on very skillfully by Jack Matloff. <laughs> And uh, I then, you know, then came to, and uh, it then is a process of, I suppose, then dealing with what has happened to you. I remember once getting out of the shower, and there was a, a mirror in front of, on the wall, and seeing a scar that ran from here to there, and then one that runs right the way down the leg, and, which was purple and quite large then, and being enraged. You know, thinking, what did they do to me? Who asked them? Which is, you know, in a way absurd because my life was saved. Researchers across the country are looking for ways to avoid bypass surgery. One possibility is the use of lasers. We would like to take laser uh, energy from a laser. A laser is really a machine that's capable of producing extremely intense light of almost one wavelength so that it has a lot of energy and it's therefore capable of doing work such as burning tissue or burning wood. And we take that, we would like to take that energy and pass it into the blood vessels by using glass rods called fiber optics and focus it upon the obstructions in the blood vessel which, uh, for example, precipitate angina and uh, kind of zap them away. Laser surgery is possible because of research at companies like Trimodyne in Southern California. Fiber optics can be inserted into arteries through a tube. And that gives the surgeon a better look inside. This happens to be a catheter that is approximately 110 centimeters in length. Uh, that's somewhere close to 40 to 42 inches in length. It can be threaded through the body's cardiovascular system, for example, beginning in the femoral artery in the leg and threaded into the heart for direct intervascular viewing. In other situations, for example, during a surgical procedure, the physician may only place the device four to six inches in a vessel to take a good look at any occlusion that may be in that vessel. The laser is shot through the tube. It melts fatty deposits, and a vacuum device can take debris out of the bloodstream. A balloon forms in the tube during surgery to keep the artery clear. The whole process takes only a small incision to insert the tube. 
I wish it could have happened 10 years down the line and I could have, I could have them be in a position maybe to have laser surgery. Um, I feel even, you know, I've always felt since this that somehow that this is almost outmoded, that they're going to be a bunch of uh, middle-aged guys walking around with these scars <laughs> down them and it will somehow be an outmoded form of surgery. Laser heart surgery is now being performed on laboratory animals and cadavers. These pictures are from experiments at Cedar sinai You can see fragments of the blockage being removed. Laser surgery has yet to be used on people in the United States, but there have been some operations in France. The FDA does not allow it here because there's still no sure way to control the path of a laser. The uh, preliminary animal work which is done to date would indicate that there is as high as a 25 to 33 percent incidence of vascular perforations. Um, if the work is being done on a peripheral artery in the leg, a vascular per perforation would not be catastrophic, could then be approached surgically and repaired. If one were to perform this uh, technique on a coronary artery in the heart and perforate the coronary artery, that could precipitate death. Doctors and technicians will continue to work on that problem. There's hope that they can find a way to control the laser within the next five years. In the meantime, people will continue to go under the knife while being grateful for the current technology which allows them to live. My father had a heart attack at exactly my age. And uh, this was in England in 1950. And he died. And uh, I realized that if I had been living then and the same thing had happened to me, if I had been him, I would have died too. Uh, but I'm alive now. And it's, a, it's, it's absolutely incredible to me. And that's a very nice, you know, it's a lovely feeling to have that. That's a poignant story for me because lasers might have helped my own father, Wendell Johnson, who died at 59 of a heart condition. So those cold boxes of microchips can offer very warm human stories. They can also offer very warm homes. Those little computers that run microwave ovens and video cassette recorders, well, they can save money on our electric bills, too, by controlling our usage. But we may want to get our power from other sources, like that nuclear power plant we keep at a safe distance called the sun. The utilities want to own it. So do consumers. Here's a report on one project where both have a place in the sun, Solar Atlanta. George Page is about to do something that could cause his family great financial distress. He's about to turn up the thermostat. It may seem to be that dramatic at your house when those fuel bills soar, but it's really not that bad for the Page family of Roswell, Georgia. Well, it can still become quite cold here in suburban Atlanta, but the Pages don't have to rely as heavily on typical energy sources. They live in a prototype solar home developed by the Georgia Power Company. It's called Future One, and it's unusual because solar panels are used to produce electricity, which runs the appliances and controls the temperature of the home. The savings make Mr. George Page feel quite cozy when paying the utility bill. We lived in an older home here in uh, Georgia, which was comparable to this, you know, 3,100 square feet, and uh, it was, uh, I think our fuel bill last winter, the winter before, was, uh, was averaging around $350, $350 a month, where this has cut it down to, uh, I would say, a third. The Page family is helping Georgia Power to learn more about the potential for solar-powered electricity. They lease the home from the utility and monitor the energy-saving devices. Mrs. Page can help to cut the fuel bill by using heavy electronic curtains, which go up in the morning and down at night. But microprocessors in a basement storage room do most of the work. They control the flow of electricity. Within the house, the thermostats, which incidentally have microprocessors within them, but they're time of day type thermostat. The microprocessors within these thermostats talk to the main microprocessors and then makes decisions on what to operate. In other words, again, selecting the best or most optimal type appliance to use given that situation. It took over $120,000 just to put the solar panels on Future One. Georgia Power also invested thousands of dollars to develop the microprocessors. But the cost of such a home in the future may be much less. Once that development cost is made, though, 
conceivably down the road it should be very cost effective. In other words, it, you should be able to put on just a small chip or a few chips what it takes several microprocessors to do right now. Someday we could all be using solar electricity without putting panels on the roof. People who visit Shenandoah, Georgia, are given a glimpse of what could be the electric power plant of the future. High-intensity solar collection dishes cover five acres of land. They generate enough power to support the needs of a textile factory about 40 yards away. Sunlight is reflected off the dishes into containers filled with silicone fluid. The liquid is piped back to a condenser where steam generates electricity and hot water controls the temperature in the factory. The water is chilled in the summertime for air conditioning. This type of solar collection fuel could also take care of about 40 homes. The cost is competitive with electricity generated with fuel oil in some parts of the country. If you go across the United States, the cost of conventional energy varies dramatically. Uh, for example, in California, they're able to pay a large amount more uh, for alternate fuels because the cost of producing regular air electricity is very high. But in Georgia, where nearby Kentucky coal is burned for power, solar devices are still more expensive. It's going to be a matter of time. Well, I see a very long period of having the various kinds of solar technology slowly moving into the scene in very special cases. But in, as in, in most high technology kinds of things and alternates to anything we're doing, it takes a long period of time to bring them into the uh, economy. So we're looking at something of the order of 20 or 25 years before any, any major penetration takes place. It's all a question of making a long-term investment. Georgia Power installed its own solar field right next to the new corporate headquarters in downtown Atlanta. The office building also has a computer brain to control the energy flow. The energy savings payback for the new building is 18 years, too long for the average company. But the people at Georgia Power believe they will soon be able to refine the system to reduce the payback by one-third. For the future, the utility is hoping for a greater push towards the marriage of computers and solar panels to increase the use of energy that other countries cannot control. If you have story ideas, suggestions, or comments about the New Tech Times, get in touch with us electronically through the source. Log on with Public 125 Direct. On CompuServe, use GoNTT. Or contact us directly through the New Tech Times electronic bulletin board by dialing 608-263-2784. Whether it's corporate high tech or back to nature self-sufficiency, Many economists and architects say we'll have to be less wasteful of petroleum and other resources, whether we want to or not. A wise American Indian elder and teacher of mine, the late Harvey Lasley, was particularly amused and saddened to watch people cut down cooling shade trees to build homes that then required air conditioning or heating because they were no longer using nature. Now architects are proposing earth shelter and solar homes that would have left Harvey less sad, but probably equally amused at our return to more natural times. One such architect, with us today by satellite from California, is Robert Easton. Bob, welcome to the New Tech Times. Yes, hello, glad to be here. Uh, perhaps it'd be useful to begin by telling us something of what it is architects do. It's more than just building houses, isn't it? Well, architects today have tried to assume some kind of a position of leadership in informing people about possibilities, new possibilities of building in a more energy efficient way. And uh, I guess I'm part of a new group of architects that have tried to expand the nature of their practice from beyond just doing uh, buildings for the rich and really trying to do buildings for people who are concerned about living responsibly within the environment. Bob, what does all this have to do with electronics? We talk here about the electronic cottage. Are you designing electronic cottages or are you designing them electronically? Basically, the technologies of building are still pretty primitive and still pretty simple. Uh, there are high-tech materials that have been developed with the advantage of computer-aided uh, engineering. But basically, building is still pretty primitive. 
However, it's the performance of a building that has really been aided by the computer. I have designed houses, solar houses for people who have computer terminals in their houses and who do work at their house plugged into uh, a larger uh, information grid. Uh, I think this is a trend among certain high-tech types of people. In other words, they will be able to do more in their house. Therefore, the house becomes more important to them and the function of the house for them, the comfort level and the quality of life in that house is more important because they're spending more time there at the house. It's not going to be true for everybody, but it, certainly at least here within the rarefied air of California with its high-tech uh, uh, kind of emphasis in industry and people, that is certainly a, 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 uh, there are a number of examples that I have, have seen and worked with. Bob, there is new technology in building techniques, but there's also new technology put inside the buildings. And one of the features we have later in, in this edition of the New Tech Times is about a house called Xanadu that is filled with uh, videotape recorders and electronic monitors and microwave ovens and programmable kitchens. Do you think that is a, uh, a meaningful uh, future for most Americans, or is that just so much fantasy and hype? <laughs> That's a great question. I think if you offer that kind of house to, to, to anybody in America, they're going to grab it and take it. It's kind of like an ideal fantasy that we all sort of uh, dream of having. Uh, I think we all yearn to be at the leading edge of technology and uh, have the latest toys. I think that it's, it's, it's meaningful in that sense to us because it sort of advances our, our, our look into the future. But in so, insofar as having us each... Uh, really be able to attain that and to be able to justify it in terms of our real performance within the economic society is another matter. Um, certain high-tech people, certain highly skilled technical people might be able to function very, very well in that type of, of setup, but it'll be, I think, really a, an attainable goal for a very, very small percentage of, 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 of an elite, let's say, a, a new age electronic elite that will be, be, be able to, to survive at the highest level of, of, of uh, conceptual society. But uh, for just you and me and uh, us ordinary people, we might have our computer, we might have a media wall, which would have uh, 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 entertainment and, and a computer for our, our certain household functions. But um, beyond the, the impact of having that, that media wall, which, which may even be in a media room, um, that is, that is a, a probably the limit of how it'll reach most of us. Architect Robert Easton, thank you very much for joining us here on the New Tech Times. Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Well, now that you're all cozy in your new home, we want to take you out of it. How about to a hockey game? Ice, pucks, sticks, fast action, occasional fights. It's a popular spectator sport. But what's it have to do with electronics? More than you might think. As with other professional sports, a lot of hockey income comes from television rights. There are even TV screens in the arena that fans seem more comfortable watching than action on the ice. And now hockey seems destined to the same computer analysis as football, baseball, and the Olympics. And the trend has begun on a college campus in upstate New York. Here's our report, produced by Anna Ray Jones. Hopped out of the corner of the right side, stick handling with it, back to the corner of the right side. There's the shot, knocked down by Pupa. And the rebound, shot, and hit the point. It's in. It's in by Jimmy Johansson. With the regular equipment of pads, helmets, and sticks, a hockey game has all the trappings of a gladiator sport. Now a graduate student from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute has added the computer to the hockey player's armory. And you have to know what kind of stride and where to stop. Rene Fredette, an engineering graduate student, recently designed a software program that teaches goaltenders how to defend the net. We were playing at Yale, and uh, the game was 3 nothing for Yale after the first period. And I went in the net. The uh, Jay was playing at that time, and Jay was pulled out. I went in. And the game came back three to three, and uh, in the third period. And then Yale scored a goal. Uh, it was a power play, and the defenseman put a nice shot, hit the post, and went in. And Coach uh, Coach Dessa said to me that I should have stopped the puck if I played the angle well. And my point to him at that time was I was in the angle, but I was not covering all the angle. And it has more to it than just that. So I set up to write a computer program to show him my point of view. The Canadian-born Fredette came to RPI as a freshman star, 
After three years on the team, he now coaches younger players. The software, he says, is ideal for teaching the basic concepts of angle coverage and can be used by college and professional goaltenders who'd like to analyze a particular shot. The angle would be this, the little star here represents where the position of the puck will be, and then here, the two lines here are the angle play by the player. And here we have like a four feet goalie, so you can see how big it would be. And that's the line. If the puck goes outside this line, it would not gonna go in. And I think this is something for the coach to know so he can teach his goalies how to play. As far as a player, if the player is really plays a little bit with this and understand the, the, the angles routine, then he can really find out where uh, what's the best place for him in the ice surface to shoot? You could call the program the electronic coach, since the computer permits a wide variety of options, such as power plays, offensive forechecking, and defensive coverage. Here, Fredette demonstrates some simple points of angle strategy. Game situation, the goalie is up there. So what we can do is have the goalie stand here and there and have him come out until you don't see the goal. That would be the best angle. What I see with my eyes is not what the puck sees. And most of the player gets fooled by this. They, especially if I'm shooting to the right side of the goalie and my eyesight is right there, I might see like a, a foot and a half open, opening, but the pucks, because it's six feet towards the inside, might only see six inches. So they, they shoot to something that they don't have, and players don't even realize that. And some goalies, uh, as you get better, you can play around with them by giving them what they think they have. Like, if, if I move out a little bit, then his eyesight's gonna open this, what he sees, and I can really, like, trap him in shooting where I want him to shoot. Computer strategy software is already a familiar accessory for football teams. Fredette foresees his program gaining steady ground with hockey teams and having further potential for soccer and lacrosse. A lot of books are written about goalies and uh, hockey, but their, their words, and sometimes, like they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. And that's what I've tried to create with this program. The computer has entered the hockey arena. Goaltenders who use it hope its electronic coaching leads to fewer red lights behind the net and fewer red faces behind the mask. Now, if you want to stay home to watch a computer-trained goalie, you may want to do it from an all-electronic house. A fellow named Roy Mason, who I ran into at the Consumer Electronics Show, has designed one for you with the unlikely name of Xanadu. It's a house filled with lots of tinsel and hype for consumer electronics. The first home was built in Wisconsin. The one we visited is in Orlando, Florida. Here's our report. Welcome to Xanadu. It's 1.46 outside temperature 81 degrees. In Central Florida, just down the road from Disney World, there's a futuristic high-tech house called Xanadu. It's a tourist attraction created by architect Roy Mason, a man who gives new meaning to the term home electronics. Most buildings today I consider are dumb. I mean, from the telecommunication system angle and also from the electronic angle. And what we do at Xanadu, we integrate architecture with electronic, which I call architronics. And uh, with the latest off-shelf technology uh, of electronic and consumer product, we integrate these things into this house so people can literally te test drive the future. Mason likes to think of Xanadu as a showplace of efficiency. The building is constructed of foam insulation. It's loaded with TV monitors, telephones, and computers, information equipment to make life less mundane. A lot of the electronics are here for the tourists to see and hear, but Mason has higher hopes for the gadgetry than just being props. You say you don't like to cook? Then listen to his plans for the kitchen of the future. We have in the kitchen what we call, which is, may not be available for the next five to 10 years, is called the auto chef, where every item of food that comes into the house has, a, you know, your bar readers at the grocery store will, look, will, in a sense, code in every item as you store it. And therefore, when the electronic dietitian select the menu for the day, robotically, the various items are selected, sliced, cooked, cooked, prepared, 
and the friendly row butler, if you want to call it, I call it uh, will be able to deliver the food to your table. If you don't like computers, if you enjoy cooking and cleaning, then you and Roy Mason will be living in different worlds. I think it's a personal choice. I think that some people, no matter what, are going to be uncomfortable with what, having uh, uh, maybe a robot or a computer doing things for them. When the, when the house member begins to realize that he is in control of that system, it's not controlling him. He can, in a sense, pull from those systems what he wants to. He can turn it off, and that's the important. He can turn off the switch. Whether it's one of Bob Easton's homes or Roy Mason's Xanadu, both serve to remind us that the new electronics offer us choices, options that we may or may not choose based on reasons even we might not fully understand. Next week, we'll be back with more stories and choices like these. In the next edition of the New Tech Times, the Atlanta software boom. They're in the chips in the Sun Belt. Also, fiber optic advances from Bell Labs and a look at the Washington State Lottery. This and more in the next edition of the New Tech Times. So join me then, won't you? For the New Tech Times staff, I'm Nicholas Johnson. Tech Times has been brought to you through a grant from Wausau Insurance Companies. Times change. Wausau works. And by the collective voice of the consumer electronics industry, the CEG, the Consumer Electronics Group, Electronic Industries Association. For a transcript of this program, send $3 to program number 125, the New Tech Times, 821 University Avenue, Madison, Wisconsin, 53706. Or you can now communicate electronically with the New Tech Times. Just call the source or CompuServe and select the New Tech Times online. <laughs>